Um, we have a great speaker for you today. Um, he's the CEO for HIMG here in Huntington. Um, he is a, an alum, alumnus of Marshall. Uh, got his BBA in accounting and has went on to do great, great things and has continually uh, moved up the ranks at HIMG from CFO to CEO. And uh, he's also um, part of our advisory board for the College of Business. And he's also been honored as a, a distinguished alum a couple years ago, I think it was. So we're glad to have him today. Please welcome Mark Morgan. Thank you all. Thank you, Glenn, for the introduction. Um, as uh, Glenn mentioned, I, I graduated from Marshall in um, 1996, uh, actually, with uh, my accounting degree. I started out in my career, and I thought, what I really want to do and so I decided I was either going to be a pharmacist or an accountant and when I thought about pharmacy I took my second semester of high school chemistry and decided pharmacy is not really for me um, so it, it turned into an accounting uh, realm and uh, we have accounting in our blood as our family I have uh, a cousin that's a, an accountant I have an uncle uh, that was an accountant and also went on and got his master's in healthcare administration. So a healthcare administration part is also part of our family. And my father started in accounting uh, here at Marshall back in the 1940s. Um, and I remember looking at his bill one time and a semester at Marshall in 1940 cost him, I think it was $32. Um, so you can imagine that's vastly different uh, than what it is today. Uh, but then he decided he got drafted uh, into the Vietnam conflict uh, and then when he came back he decided he wanted to be a minister so he went to Bible college and so that's vastly different from accounting uh, as you can uh, well know. So um, a little bit more about me. I, I was born and raised here in Huntington. I graduated from the old Huntington East High School which is now the Cabot County Board of Education uh, offices. I uh, graduated from there then came to Marshall uh, live uh, in Barbersville, uh, started out in, uh, with an accounting firm. I did an internship when I was at, at Marshall. That internship to me was invaluable. Um, I felt like I learned um, more for the professors in the room, excuse this comment, but I felt like I learned more in that internship than I did in my classes. Uh, and what I say to, to people is that the internship pro process, what you learned in, in class was all black and white. You learned everything uh, that was by the book. And then when you got into the real world, you, you realized how things functioned. Uh, and things aren't always black and white uh, in the real world. Uh, I say things are 2% black and 2% white. And then the rest of that is some short of, shade of gray. And that's normally where I operate in is that shade of gray uh, on a regular basis. And most people will do in the real world. Um, so that's uh, my piece of advice for the day. As we, we go, if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, so I, I did that internship, and I had a couple of uh, really good professors at, at Marshall. Um, I don't believe they're, one of them I know is past. The other one I don't think teaches any longer, but Charlie Webb, um, for those um, who might know Charlie Webb, and um, Kyle McMullen. And the reason I think I liked both of those guys so well uh, was that they... Uh, were practicing accountants. Um, so they worked in the real world and, and taught part-time. They just weren't in academics 100%. Um, so those were one of the things that uh, I really enjoyed. Get to know them, and it was interesting. A few years ago, I was sitting across the table uh, from Charlie Webb as he represented a local physician um, selling his practice to our group. Um, so it's kind of interesting how things come full circle with some of your former uh, professors. Um, so after I graduated Marshall, I uh, went to work in public accounting, uh, worked for a firm for about a year, then I transitioned over to a second firm um, called Trainer Wright and Paterno uh, that was based here in Huntington, had office in uh, Charleston, and then also an office in southern West Virginia in Gilbert, West Virginia, um, if anybody knows where Gilbert is. Um, but So I'd go down there, we had a lot of coal clients, a lot of timber clients uh, that we did work for, but we also did uh, a lot of health care. Um, I kind of focused on the audit side of the practice um, actually became the partner, the youngest partner in the firm's history. Um, and I, I guess I was just stupid because I agreed to say, oh yeah, I'll be a partner. I didn't realize the financial constraints that that uh, puts on a person uh, when you do that in your life, uh, but it does because uh, it's not, not cheap to buy into a, a firm by any means. Uh, but 
uh, worked through the, the practice, uh, did a lot of work in healthcare uh, and also in employee benefit plans uh, was another area I focused a lot of my time in. Kind of built up the firm quite a bit. But what I realized uh, as I was uh, doing that, I had, I had children, um, had, uh, I have three kids. Uh, my kids were growing up and I was missing out on a lot because I was on the road about 70% of the time. I was spending more nights away from home than I was at home uh, in the auto side. So I decided, let's make a change. Um, so I was fortunate enough um, to have a client of mine that was Huntington Internal Medicine Group or HIMG. Um, and I said something to the CEO one day. I said, if you happen to be thinking about making a change or look for somebody different from a CFO role, uh, please let me know. I said, I might have some interest uh, in doing that. And he kind of looked at me and he said, really? And I said, sure. So about three months later, he called me up one day and he said, you know, he said, I'm just not happy with my CFO. Um, he said, you know, can we work something out? And I said, well, sure, I'll go to lunch with you. We'll see what we can do, talk. Um, so I went, met with him. Then about a month later, um, I transitioned over as uh, actually chief administrative officer of HIMG. And so let me just a moment, if you're not familiar with HIMG, um, it is a, a multi-specialty physician practice. Uh, we have about 80 providers uh, in the practice. We're located right out on um, Route 60, right at the intersection of uh, Interstate 64 at the 29th Street exit. With that, uh, we have about 300 employees, have a lot of primary care physicians, a lot of specialists, uh, and we also do a lot of what we call ancillary services. So we do our own lab work, we have radiology, uh, et cetera, uh, within the practice. So. Um, I transitioned out there uh, in 2007, um, and when I came home with my ID badge, I went in about a week or two to do a bunch of paperwork uh, prior to uh, joining there. And so I came home with my ID badge, and they had given me the title, instead of Chief Financial Officer, they gave me the title of Chief Administrative Officer. So I'd been at the group uh, about six months, uh, and the CEO walks in one day and says, I'm leaving, I'm moving to Iowa. And I was like, oh my gosh, I was like, what did I just do? I was like, okay, now the person who brought me on board, I know a little bit about healthcare, don't know a lot about um, everything in this group, but I, I know a little bit about healthcare. I know about accounting, so what am I gonna do? Am I gonna stay here? I was a partner at this firm, I gave it all up to come here because I thought I'd have a nice career here for the next you know, five to 10 years, learn a lot more about healthcare and then move on to a hospital role uh, or another role uh, similar. So as I did that, I went home and we talked to, talked to my wife and so about a week later the, we have a board of directors that oversees the group and the board president came in to me and said, you know, Mark, we'd like you to be interim CEO. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, I've been here six months and they want me to run the place already? I was like, what are they thinking? I was like, I could be their children, their child. I mean, I, you know, a lot of them were in their 50s or 60s and I literally could be, I was the same age as a lot of their kids. Um, so anyway, I, I moved into that role and served into that role, uh, I think it was about seven months, um, and then when they brought on a new CEO, and so I, I went back to my administrative role. And so as in that administrative role, what I did was I oversaw um, HR, uh, human resources, uh, financial office, so the accounting staff, the business office staff, and in healthcare, if you're not familiar with most healthcare operations, they operate a finance office and they operate a business office. So the finance office really is your day-to-day -day accounting. It's all your debits and credits, um, all the fun stuff that you do, your AP, paying your bills, paying payroll, et cetera. Um, the business office is all about the billing cycle within healthcare. And if you're, and the, the billing cycle within healthcare is a cumbersome mess, I will say. Um, it, they've made it so difficult to do. Why in the world we pay or charge somebody $100 for something we know we're gonna get paid $50 for and right off the rest of it makes no sense to me, no logical sense from an accounting standpoint. But that's the world that we've created um, to do. So nonetheless, that's, that's how we do it, but you have a whole group of people. In our finance office with all those employees, we, we did this past year, just, we just preliminary closed our books. We just did over $80 million of net revenue. We have seven companies that we operate and um, all those employees. We have two people in our finance office and then a CFO. So we really operate all that off of three people. But in our business office, we have over 40 people. So why do we have so many people in our business office? All because of the billing aspects that we have to do. 
We you know, send out well over a thousand bills a day to payers, to, to uh, patients, et cetera. Uh, so a lot of that uh, happens over there. Um, so moving back to the uh, role, I went back to my CFO role, functioned in that capacity, uh, and then in 2000, uh, well, four years ago, um, today actually, or yesterday, um, or five years ago yesterday, I moved into the CEO role. Um, and um, they had uh, decided they wanted to make a change with the old CEO and, and move me into that position. Um, so I joined the, the group as the CEO at that time. Um, if you would have asked me when I was in college, would I be in healthcare in this capacity today? I would have said no. Uh, my, my vision was set purely on public accounting. I thought I was going to be a, a public accountant, be a CPA. I was going to work. I was going to be one of those audit warriors that's out there. And you know, was becoming a, a partner was a huge goal of, of mine. I achieved that goal. Um, and then all of a sudden, it wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. Um, so where I'm at today versus where I thought I'd be today are two vastly different, different tracks. Um, with the um, uh, transition or those, those years, we have uh, done a lot of different things and I've learned a lot of things uh, within healthcare. One of the biggest things that I think uh, coming from a financial background and moving into healthcare, especially into the role of like a CEO or a CFO, one of the biggest things I wish I would have learned when I was in school or been able to understand more was really, I wish I would have taken more psychology classes. Um, it's one of those things you don't think about. I remember taking my two psychology classes or required classes that I had to take just to graduate. But what you deal with, you're dealing with people every day. You're dealing with physicians, you're dealing with staff, you're dealing with other providers, you're dealing with the community, you're dealing with uh, patients, patient issues, and understanding psychology and how people function and think and getting inside their heads is one of the, the skill sets that's one of the most, I think, important and one of the things that people don't realize that they really need. I think the only better person to be in a position like mine, other than a financial person, is someone with a psychology degree. Because um, you really got to get to know the people uh, that you're dealing with. You got to understand what makes them tick on a day-to-day -day basis, how you can communicate with um, them. Like some one physician, I can sit there and we can yell at each other across the table, have a very heated discussion. We can shake hands, walk out, and go have a beer. Another physician, I can't raise my voice to because they'll get offended, they'll cry, whatever it means. And yes, I've seen, I've made men cry before. Um, that's a hard thing to do, but it does happen. Um, so you, you see those things, but I'm just understanding what goes on with them. Get to know them. Get to know the people that work for you and you work with. That's the other aspect within the psychology. Because if you know what it is, you can, you can always start off a conversation. If you're getting ready to have a difficult conversation with a person, if you know their kids' names, if you know their wife's name, if you know they like to go watch birds, uh, on weekends. They like to go um, not bird hunting, but truly watch birds. Then you can sit down and you can start a conversation with something that's common to them and get them comfortable with that conversation before you ever um, move forward. So that's a great aspect of uh, the psychology piece and learning psychology. Does your organization provide any type of training before you train to help stimulate this, this learning? No, no, we don't provide any formal training whatsoever with that, with our managers. We, well, I, I'll take that back. We did not. Over the last year, we have um, developed a training program with our management team, uh, and part of that is having these types of conversations. There's a great book called um, uh, Crucial Conversations, I believe is the name title of that book. Um, and um, so if you it talks about all these different situations that you're always in on a regular basis and how to handle those um, from um, their mentality or their standpoint. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Um, again, it's got to go, you've got to understand the person you're across the table with uh, or having that conversation with. Uh, well, if you understand what them, then you can have it. But so we've started that. Uh, we've done some of that crucial conversation training uh, and had that. But other than that, outside the management realm, we have not done it anywhere else uh, within the practice. 
that one of the other things that um, you know, I've learned in accounting that or in, in healthcare that's important uh, is always reading. Um, and my father always told me reading is knowledge. As a child, I wasn't a big reader. I didn't like to read. I'd read a little bit. Um, but I, one of my vivid memories, my dad, um, he was a minister, but he also um, drove a, a milk truck, if you can believe what a milk truck used to look like 30 years ago. But he'd drive this milk truck, and, but on, he was off on Thursday. So we always went to the library um, on Thursdays. And so I, that's a very vivid memory for me uh, in the summer months, especially when school wasn't in, going to the library with him, getting books. He'd always get books. And uh, we always had books around the house to read. My, my dad was an avid reader. Uh, but when I was younger, that didn't really uh, rub off on me. I didn't really care for reading too much. Uh, but then as I got into um, college, I realized that reading is a pretty important aspect. And uh, understanding uh, and being able to read, uh, keeping up on current knowledge um, is very important. Uh, reading um, other things related to business just reading casual stuff, too, is always a good thing to do. Um, every morning, or almost every morning, I won't say every morning, depends on my meeting schedule, I normally get in the office about 6.30, 6.45 in the morning, and my first 15 to 30 minutes of every morning is spent reading, um, whether it's reading a magazine about health care, uh, whether it's reading a magazine about financial um, issues, is reading a leadership book or some sort of management-style book, or a book on, about healthcare and changes in healthcare or the healthcare world. Um, I do that every, religiously every morning. I also read at home, always reading nonfiction, fiction. I just I have typically two or three books going at a particular time. My wife, it drives my wife crazy that I read that, that many books at a time. She's like, I don't understand how you can keep up with it, but it's just one of those things I do. Um, so, but reading, that's another uh, aspect of healthcare that's very important because things change. I mean, we are constantly in healthcare. There's a constant change of regulations, uh, things that you're doing, uh, are required to do from different payers, from CMS, uh, et cetera, Medicare. Um, so, uh, making sure you're keeping up on all of that. Um, you know, just reading email. That's another aspect. I mean, I get you know, over 200 emails a day, um, and I stay constantly behind on email just because I get so many, and I, I'm out in meetings doing things. Um, and so those are, are issues that you just need to make sure that you're always willing to read, willing to learn what's in those things, and then being able to apply what you've been able to read uh, there. So, so along that issue, since you talk about reading and the importance of it, and I stress it to students, how much have you read, I'm just personally, how much have you read concerning the new regulations that came out January 1 about transparency and pricing? Um, quite a bit. Um, and, you know, we were kind of a trendsetter um, in this community on transparency and pricing. Because if you go to our website, um, if you would pull up our website, at, and it's a uhswv.com is, is the website address, we have a link on our website that says HIMG pricing. And it'll tell you exactly how much you're going to pay for healthcare services. Not everything that we do, but I think it probably has the top 100 or so. Um, uh, what we call CPT codes um, out there. Um, to, you can pull up and it says the charge is going to be X again, and if you're a private pay patient, this is what you're going to pay. Um, it doesn't say if you're an insurance patient what you're going to pay, but it does have that. So I think transparency is very important in healthcare. I think it's something that we've lacked. Um, and I think if we could go change the accounting methods like we've talked about um, to just if we're going to charge you $50 and you're going to pay us $50 instead of charging you 100 and you're going to pay us 50. Um, I think that would go a long way to help the transparency aspects across the entire system. But reading transparency issues, that's been a, um, a very important thing to me uh, to make sure that's doing. Because again, we were, uh, we were the only people in the community doing it until uh, this year. And, and honestly, I can't, you know, the, both the hospitals are supposed to have it out there, but I, I have not gone to their websites to look to see what they're disclosing at this point. I have seen those, but I have seen you. Yeah. Um, and then the, in the state, um, so within West Virginia, in most states, they have a health um, hospital association. So the hospital association is one of the things that's kind of, they've uh, pushed, they were pushing out something on a global basis at the state hospital association, but I haven't looked on their website either to see what that looks like. 
Um, so moving on from uh, reading, um, one of the other uh, things I think that I didn't necessarily um, appreciate or uh, do until I got into healthcare was uh, being more of a risk taker. I mean, you've got to take risk um, in life in general. You've got to do it. You need to do it in your in your professional careers as well. Um, and that's to some degree stepping outside that comfort zone that you're in. I mean, everybody gets into this is what I'm comfortable doing and I don't particularly like to do this. Me, I mean, taking a risk is not coming in public speaking. I do that too often um, for this to be a risk. But um, for me, taking a risk is more like, you know, we have um, this opportunity opportunity to invest in company Y. Well, company Y is not something that's in the healthcare arena or something that we're comfortable with doing. So we need, are we willing to take the risk to invest in this when we think it's a good investment? And if you were doing it personally, would you consider doing that? Um, so that was one of the things that I've really learned over the last um, 11 years of my healthcare career is really a lot about risk taking. Um, you got to put yourself out there, push yourself, promote yourself, um, and, and take a lot of risk in doing that. Um, so I think um, being a risk taker is a good thing when it comes to healthcare. Now there's times it can be to your detriment and you'll end up getting terminated over the risk that you took because it turned out bad. Um, but sometimes it's still, the majority of the time, if you do it in a, your, the proper analysis of what the risk is, then being able to take that risk is a good thing. Um, so that's uh, another aspect. Um, being willing to um, constantly learn, we've talked a little bit about reading, but also about learning. Um, understand all aspects of your business uh, is one of the issues. We have a very diverse group uh, where we have, um, we have people who make a million dollars a year in our practice, and we have people that are providers that make $80,000 a year in our practice, and we have employees that make you know, $400,000 a year, and we have employees that make $20,000 a year. So being able to understand those and how they operate and how important each one of those are uh, within your operation. A lot of times those employees that are your $10 hour employees are some of the most um, uh, you're dependent on to make that person who's making a half million dollars, a million dollars, they're more important to that person than anybody else um, because they can control the flow of patients to them. They can control a lot of things. So make sure you understand how those things operate within your practice. Uh, make sure you understand that the billing office, how it operates is as important as the front person who's answering the phone. Uh, when you're answering the phone, um, you know, you, you want to, we, we try to teach our people, if you answer the phone, you know, have a smile on your face while you're answering the phone. They say, well, why, do, why, why should I have a smile on my face? Nobody can see me. And, we all, and it's one of those cliches. They may not be able to see you, but they can definitely hear that smile uh, through the phone. Uh, and people don't always realize that or get that, but that's one of those things that we really um, strive and push is make sure you're always smiling, always positive uh, in your interactions uh, with, with patients and with other staff. We talk a lot about customer service um, and understanding customer service. And, you know, customer service isn't just that I'm working, you call me up and have, we have a conversation, um, you're trying to sell me a supply, for example. It's when one of my other managers or one of my other staff, they call me and the interaction I have between myself and them, that's also your, they're your customer right then. Um, so even your employees that you're working with, your coworkers are also your customers. Um, anybody who's walking through the door, anybody talking on the phone, customer service is a huge aspect of uh, interacting with the, with the public. Um, one of the uh, other aspects is being willing to go out and um, learn from other people. You know, make connections, network. Uh, that's, uh, you know, in public accounting, networking um, at the public, with other public accountants, maybe not always the most important things. It might be important to network uh, when you go out into the community. 
um, to develop some additional clientele there. Um, but it's really uh, important in healthcare to network because you're always learning about other things that happen at other places. You always want to learn more knowledge about how they're handling a particular situation. Um, and we created about um, two years ago, three years ago, a little group within the Huntington area of all the uh, people who handle physician practices. So, um, and we call it the Huntington Healthcare Consortium, I believe is what our, is how we titled it. But it's about, um, so we have people from our practice, people from both the hospitals, from Marshall Health, um, some private practices, and we all come together. We get speakers together um, on about a quarterly basis, and somebody hosts it. We have a little bit of, of food, a little drink, um, and then we have a presentation uh, at those. And, but it also, it's all about the networking that goes along with that, being able to know what someone across town is doing, getting to know that person so if I have an issue, I can pick up the phone and I can call someone at Marshall Health and say, you know, what are, how are you all handling this issue? Because uh, I know you're having the exact same issue we're having. How do you all handle it? Um, so getting that, that network and the advice that we have uh, is an important aspect of that. So I'll pause just for a moment. Anybody have any questions you'd like to ask? Thanks. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, can you, you touched on it a little bit, but can you emphasize and stress the importance in healthcare of the, of the word team? We are a team. <laughs> uh, yes, we are. A, a team is very important. And this is something that I will say um, that it, myself personally, I've evolved um, in the, uh, the last few years uh, about the word team and how the team functions. Um, so we can look at it multiple ways. You can look at it at the physician level. They have to be a team because you want, if you're going to see a primary care doctor and you have a heart problem, then you want the primary care doctor working with your cardiologist, not against or sending you over there and never hearing from them. You want them working with your cardiologist. Let's say you have to have, be hospitalized because you have heart failure. Um, so then they're probably working with uh, a pulmonologist at that time. So you develop a team of providers that are all able to communicate and talk with each other and they're jointly handling your situation. So you look at it from a provider level like that. Bring it down to a management level. We have a team, I have a team of about 20 people uh, that are on my management team uh, within the, and that's called a team. It's, you know, that's one of the, the terms there. Um, so all of us need to be working together to make sure we're providing an efficient operation. Um, when, I, when I assumed my CEO role, I felt like, you know, I had, I'll say I had three tiers of teams. I had what I called my senior management team, I had my tier one team, and then I had all my managers. And one of the things that we seem to do a lot is we, People love to meet for whatever reason. I mean, they, people love to be in meetings. And I think because it, it makes a lot of people feel important. Me, one of those, I'm one of those people, I would rather be at my desk working than sitting through a meeting after meeting after meeting because I feel like I get more accomplished that way. But again, that's, that's a personal thing and that's something I think I can do a lot more than I can if I'm in a meeting working with the team. But the, the, my fallacy in all of that is, is you've got to, Put that team together and have those other people helping you row in that boat because if you're out there rowing the boat and you're trying and you're trying to get up the new river going the opposite direction by yourself it's pretty daggone difficult to do that but if you have three four five ten twenty people helping you it's much easier to get up that river uh, with it um, so it's very important to get those all those people together uh, to make things work um, yeah, I may dictate, certain, not dictate, but I may help, you know, push along certain agendas, but we all have to be rowing in the same boat to get to the point. So the team aspect is very important from a management side, it's important from a physician side, and it's important from an employee side. Um, you know, again, you go to a similar process of a primary care physician and a cardiologist, I need my secretaries talking to each other and working together to get that patient transferred from primary care to, to cardiology. So even at that level, everybody has to be working on the same team for the same goal at the end. 
And that's what a lot of people don't um, think about. They don't think about the goal. What's the goal at the end? It's just, I'm trying to get this done. But what's our ultimate goal? And your ultimate goals, a lot of times, you need to go back and you need to look at what your mission, vision, and value statements are. Um, you know, I don't know that uh, people really focus on mission, vision, value statements. Um, I, we did ours, we redid ours about five years ago, um, but we're in the process right now of revamping our mission, vision, and values because we were, they were great, they were wordy, they looked good, sounded good, but were we really trying to achieve what was in those statements? Um, so now we're going back, we're simplifying our mission statement instead of a, about a 40 word statement, I think we're gonna make it about a 10 word statement. So it's something I can memorize and always have at my forefront and say, this is what we're here. We're here, we're, we're teaming together. Again, we're using the word team to provide um, great healthcare for our patients and the community. It's gonna be something along those lines. So um, you know, make sure that you have those statements and if you have them, that you're abiding by them, living by them, and you're trying to, um, you put everybody in the same boat to get to that same accomplishment. So. On that note, one, and I share this with my students as well, one of the places that I've worked in in my past, being asked the vision and the mission statement was the very first thing that came up on your evaluation, and if you did not know them, that didn't bode well for you. Yeah. So I, when we started this process, what I realized was that uh, we didn't, I didn't think we were following our mission statement very well. And so I did that at a management meeting. So I had all my managers in there. Um, and one of my other pet peeves in meetings, um, and, and don't take this personally, anybody in the room doing it, but if I don't want to see a cell phone, I don't want to see a laptop, I don't want any technology in it. Um, I personally don't bring them into meetings uh, unless it's something I'm required to have to present with. Um, I don't like them um, because they're distracting. Um, and to me, it says that that equipment is more important to you than what's happening at the meeting level. So that's one of my pet peeves, and we very rarely do that. But when we have our full management meeting, you know, there we have a manager may have 60 employees, and so they're employees always calling about something or sending a text or one of the physicians or providers are always calling or sending about a text. So at this management meeting, uh, what I did, I took a box, I took every, I took every cell phone um, out of everybody's hands, I took every laptop out of, there was only a couple laptops, took all those, put them in a room outside where we're at, and then I asked them to write the, the mission statement. It was unbelievable what we got, or what I got out of that. It was, I couldn't believe it. And so at that point, and then I asked him, so we have our mission, our vision, our value. Our values are made up of seven words, and the first letter of each of, the, of those seven words spells the word service. And we preach service in our new higher orientation throughout the year. We're always talking about service, service, service. But then my management team couldn't even tell me what the seven words were that made service, and some of them couldn't even tell me that it was service. So, um, you know, it's like, okay, we gotta go back to the drawing board here and start this whole process over. So we did that, we started that process, I believe it was in July or August. Um, and then, and the other thing we did, we just, we stopped and we said, we gotta get to know each other again. Um, because we had man we had had some turnover within our managers and we said we got to know each other um, so when I, I do a, a CEO lunch once a month for some of my staff um, and they're able to come in um, typically six of them and we can talk about whatever they want those in that hour have lunch they get their time with me if they want to tell me something that's going on in the practice I may not know or problems they're having or things they want to see it's their opportunity um, and then we take those and try to make some actionable items out of those and make things happen. So at the start of that though, I always make everybody introduce themselves because you're bringing people from different parts of our building, from uh, our business office that don't coincide. And we always start off with an introduction about ourselves, you know, our name, make sure everybody knows our names, A. Then they know, you know, what we, all, what we have personally, such as are we married, 
um, how many kids we have, how many grandkids we have, et cetera. Um, and then we always tell something about ourselves that's kind of unique. Um, so I made the managers all go around the room, stand up and introduce themselves. We ended up that day in like a three hour meeting, which I was kind of surprised it was that long, but it was a great meeting. So then the next meeting, uh, when we came back around the month later, we said, all right, let's, who wants to volunteer to stand up and tell me something personal about everybody in this room? It goes back to one of my earlier comments about psychology. If you know something about that person, you can have a conversation about it. And you don't have to talk about business all the time. People know I love sports. So they can sit there and they can talk to me about, um, we'll just talk about like Tuesday morning, somebody was in my office talking about the Marshall basketball game Monday night. And can you believe he stepped out of bounds? How do you step out of bounds? You know, that was the words I began. I was like, I understand. Um, but so we have this conversation and then we can go on and talk about business, but it's always something to break the ice there. But I had people go around the room and tell me something unique about that. So it allowed everybody to learn a little bit more about each other uh, on a personal level uh, that they didn't necessarily see. Because you come to work, you spend as much work, time at work interacting with people than you do at home when you think about it. I mean, you spend, I spent, me personally, I know I spend more time in that building or working than I do when I'm home, uh, than I am at home. So it's important to do that. Um, but, you know, a lot of people, going back to the, the team mission, vision, value, that those mission, vision, values are important. And you've got to learn to, you need to learn to live by what those say. You need to know them, you need to make sure you understand them, and that you're willing to live by them or, or you know, make your work life abide by those mission, vision, and values. And then we took it, we've taken it a step further. If you have a mission, vision, and value, then Shouldn't your strategic plan also come back in to, to say, if I have these, these values, then how does my strategic plan relate to these values? How do these v values, how can I make these values my strategic plan? Um, so what we did is we took that acronym of service and we set up what each one of those means to us. Um, and then what are the things under each one of those words that we can say is how we want, what we want to achieve over the next year, three years, five years. Um, so that's how we did it. So we tied our strategic plan right back into our mission, vision, and value statement is, is how it worked. Well, yes? Well, you uh, speak very highly of like psychology in general. I'm just curious if you made a point to the higher psychologists or people who made their um, we do have a psycho clinical psychologist on staff. Now they are doing clinical work mainly. Um, I will say I do bend her ear from time to time about issues. Um, so she's not there for a, biz for a, a business uh, side of the, the realm, but she does practice as a practicing psychologist for our patients. So, um, and that's, and it, one of the things in, the, in healthcare um, one of the biggest need areas that there is is behavioral health. Um, you know, there's a huge shortage of behavioral health specialists um, in this area and across the country. And, um, you know, getting them into a, a practice setting is uh, very important. Um, and it's one of those things, especially with the opioid epidemic, um, it, you wouldn't believe some of the chronic diseases that we see people have, um, you know, we, we have a, a large cancer practice or oncology practice. You know, people getting diagnosed with, um, you know, stage three, stage four cancer, being able to understand what that is, and having that psychologist being able to be there to help the family understand what it means to have stage three or stage four um, cancer is very important, and it allows them because they're not, you know, if, if you walk in and you tell me I have stage four cancer, I'm gonna react differently than someone who has no medical knowledge whatsoever. So you tell them stage four, they're, they're just trying to grasp what stage four means. Um, so then the psychologist is there with them, with the physician as they're breaking that news to the patient. Um, they're able then to be able to talk about, you know, this is what this really means. This is how it's gonna impact your life. Uh, and these are the things that we can do to help in that and uh, transition. So. Uh, behavioral health is a uh, psychology is a, a, a huge gap just from a clinical side, um, but I think from a business side, that's one of the places we don't see enough people um, from the business world either uh, in psychology. 
other yes so I noticed that you said that there was some turnover in the officer in that HMG and you went from CAO to interim CEO to CEO so I want to know is there something that you're doing or you did that helped you land those positions I have cameras on me, so I got to be careful what I say. <laughs> Sorry, so just because I'm, uh, I'm smart, but no, that's really not it. I, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the world uh, by any means. I, if you go back and you pull my transcript, you'd say, how in the world is this guy a CEO? Um, it, kind of the funny aspect is when I started Marshall, I had so many people say, oh, don't worry about it. You'll do fine there. I always made very good grades, graduated with honors from high school, et cetera. And, uh, they said, oh, you'll have no problem at Marshall. And I was like, okay. So I came first semester, I had 16 hours, because I only had 16 because I had biology and had to have my lab um, that first semester. Didn't have any problem second semester, but I mean the first semester, but second semester I decided, I don't have to go to class every day, you know? It's just typical college thinking, you know, you don't have to go to class, you can party a little bit, have fun. Well, when I got my grades that, that second semester, I decided, okay, this is not for me. I shouldn't have been doing that. Um, so then I had to reapply uh, myself uh, to get back into that. But I think it's really um, what it, to me, the thing is, is a few things. Work ethic is probably the biggest thing. Um, they see a dedicated person. Um, I'm, I'm by no means the smartest person, probably not the smartest person in this room. Um, but I, I just have a really good, a strong work ethic. And I think that goes back to my parents or my father specifically. Um, and as I said, I got to know people. I listened to people. I was able to compromise with people. I didn't always dictate the way things went. Um, and I was able to produce results uh, with some, I made some, and when I said, I had said you had to take risk. I mean, we took a couple of risks and those turned out very well for the group uh, financially. So those are things that they kind of rewarded me with by being able to do this. Um, so it's just, it's a myriad of those things. Um, and we always had a saying when I was in public accounting, it's not um, what you know, um, it's who you know. And really I can say uh, to a great degree, I would, I would echo that in most of things in business. It's really about 50% who you know, about 20% how you interact with them, um, and then 10% what you know, and um, then the balance is dealing with um, with how you present yourself um, is the other aspect of it. So what you know really is a minimal amount, I think, when it comes down to it um, in, the, in the early period. Now, once you're there, it's obviously a lot about what you know, but, but getting into certain positions, being able to achieve certain things is a lot about those other aspects um, of your, your, uh, how you present yourself. We turned the corner here just for one sure. second and change the subject for a minute. I asked my students yesterday a question, and it involved payment, reimbursement, and so forth with the, you know, <clears throat> from a healthcare facility. And society as a whole, regardless of how hard we work and how hard we try to change things, are we still going to end up with the poor, the middle class, and the wealthy? Because there's been so much effort put into, oh, we have to change it to bring these people up to this standard, and <coughs> and it's a question, you know, from a society, from a social aspect, that you know, yeah. people wrestle with. Yeah, I, I don't know that I have a great answer for that. Um, personally, I would say we're probably always going to have a, a, I guess, a tiered society, if you want to call it that. Um, you're always going to have different classes of, of people. Um, you know, I, I used to, they used to say that everybody had the opportunity of the American dream. I don't think that's the case any longer. Uh, I think there are certain people that just don't have that opportunity. Um, you know, and, and I'll go back to the opioid issues uh, within the country. I mean, a lot of people just have no chance to ever survive. And, and having these children born with this opioid addiction or this addiction to um, opioids, that I, I don't know how that's going to come out. I, we don't know what those kids are going to be like 10 years from now, 15 years. We don't understand the development aspect of that yet. So there's a lot to be uh, determined. 
Um, so I think there's always going to be some sort of tiering of society. That gap may close, uh, but I don't think it's going to um, uh, change drastically and um, go further apart. The whole point of me asking that was, is, and as I told the student, we still have to deliver care. Oh, at the end of the day, yes. Yeah, that's the bottom Yeah, if someone presents to our office and they're in an emergent situation, I don't, I'm not worried about their insurance. I'm not worried if they can pay me or not. I'm worried about being a humanitarian and providing care to that person. The other things happen on the backside, um, but it's really about providing the care up front. And that's, you know, clinic, clinicians are, um, are trained um, to, you know, always provide care no matter what they do. Um, you know, you have uh, issues with uh, people providing uh, or being concerned about um, litigation now with the malpractice world that we live in. Uh, and I, I'm not one, uh, as a, I don't watch hardly any TV except, when it, except unless it relates to sports. Um, so, like, I, we were watching the football games on Sunday, and, you know, the local commercials that were on, half of them were, you know, lawyers, you know, nursing home abuse, or you're in a car wreck, you know, call me, we'll get your justice, et cetera. So, I mean, we're, people are constantly concerned about litigation. Physicians and uh, providers are no different uh, from that. So with that, we have um, a lot of people, what we do call defensive medicine. Uh, they, don't, they do things to increase the cost of care, but they really don't need to do it, but they're doing it to prevent themselves. Um, hospital emergency rooms are the worst place for that to happen. Um, you go in and you say you have chest pain. Well, they're gonna put you, they're gonna connect you to an EKG machine, the first thing they're gonna do. They're probably gonna order a CT, or they're gonna order some sort of, of um, nuclear study on you. And it may just be, uh, you know, you just may have you know, severe indigestion, or you may have a bad gallbladder for, you know, is what it is, and it's causing all that heart pain. Um, so that, because gallbladders present as symptoms as a heart attack. Um, so that happens a lot of times. So you do all those things to rule that out, and then it ends up being a pretty easy fix and a pretty simple fix uh, overall. And so people, you run up the cost of care because you're doing all these things that are unnecessary. Or, and this is another issue that runs into the healthcare cost spectrum, is, you know, our office, we are, we're sending a patient over for surgery tomorrow. We did all their lab work at the office before they went there. We did their CT study. All that was supposed to be over at the hospital. Well, they show up at the hospital and for some reason they don't have it. Well, instead of picking up the phone and calling our office and say, you know, do this, they'll repeat all that. Well, that's doubled up everything for that, that patient. So that's been uh, uh, an issue that you run into from a cost standpoint. Um, you know, one of the things that I'll, I'll talk on just a few minutes uh, is about a little bit about you know the um, some of the regulation aspect of healthcare. Um, so we deal with um, in numerous payers, numerous. We have about a, just over a thousand uh, patient visits per day in our building. So with that, we have to deal with Medicare. We have to deal with. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, PIA or Public Employees Insurance here in West Virginia. Um, we may have to uh, deal with Blue Cross Blue Shield um, Anthem out of Ohio or Kentucky, um, deal with Humana. So we have, we'll end up dealing with about 35 to 40 different insurance agencies on a daily basis. Every one of them has a different rule. So we have to understand and know what the rules are for each one of those organizations. Um, you know, one, if I'm ordering a CT, um, this insurance company requires that I get a pre-cert pre on that or a, a pre-certification. So you have to then request that. We have a whole separate department. That's all they do. We have eight people that just do pre-certs all day long. And that's just an added cost to healthcare. And 90% of the time, we get our pre-certification through there. So to me, it's kind of a worthless process. But then you'll have insurance, the other insurance, they don't want the pre-cert on the CT. They only want it if you're doing con what they call contrast. So they inject a dye so they can see things a little better when they're doing a, your CT scan. So then you have to know that. So you have to build, build all these rule engines within um, your systems and your electronic medical records 
to make it um, understand what everybody needs to do. So there's constant regulation, constant oversight uh, that you have to have, you have to be causing of, of what it is, uh, how it functions, and what you need to do for everybody. Um, and you know, the government continues to um, make new rules that they push those rules down to uh, other people um, and to the other carriers. As those other carriers uh, do and develop their rules, they do them a little differently. So then you have to learn those again. So it's just a constant um, process that you have to go through of keeping up with those regulations um, and the risks. So, you know, litigation, concerned about litigation, and then also all these risk-based uh, rules that you have to know for the payers is a whole different realm and a whole different problem uh, that, you, that everybody has to deal with in, our, in the medical world. Other questions? Have you folks met every one of the high-tech standards that you have as far as electronic records and all that stuff? We, we have. We've met all of our high-tech standards. We've met our MIPS and MACRA um, scores. Um, so we're, we've achieved everything that we should be achieving. Um, we're getting our first, I was told yesterday, we're getting our first uh, MIPS payments from 2007. They just hit our thing. Um, so we're getting, we got a 1.6% payment boost from Medicare, but they took 2% for sequestration. So you're still negative 4% uh, on it. So it's just kind of crazy um, how that all uh, works. So they're giving you money, but they're taking more money away. Uh, but we've, we've done that. We've had an EHR. We were uh, some of the first people in Huntington that had an EHR. So we've had ours since 2006. Um, and um, it's uh, gone through a lot of changes uh, with us. It's been a pain at times. It's been a, a blessing at times. Uh, but it, it, uh, uh, it's, been, it's, a, it's a lot of work to maintain, a lot of cost to maintain. There's a great article um, called um, Why Doctors Hate Their Computers. Um, it was written by a gentleman by the name of Atul Gwande. Uh, uh, Dr. Gwande is a surgeon um, who's originally from Athens, Ohio. His father was a nephrologist uh, that was at OU, taught at OU, uh, and then also practiced there in Athens. Uh, but um, uh, Dr. Gwande, he's actually the gentleman, if you've heard, um, Berkshire Hathaway. I don't know if people are familiar with Berkshire Hathaway or not. Um, and J.P. Morgan, and I know you know Amazon. Uh, everybody knows Amazon. So those three have teamed together to form a new healthcare. Um, uh, they're trying to fix healthcare, and especially for their own employees. Um, so he's leading this. He's a surgeon, again, out of uh, Boston. Um, he wrote a book a few years ago called Being Mortal. Um, it's a, a great book to read, especially if you have aging parents. Um, and it talks about death. I mean, it's all about dying and how to handle death uh, at the end, at the you know, end of life and end of life care and the costs that go into it. He did, he wrote it from a surgeon's perspective, but then he also wrote it from his um, own um, uh, perspective of dealing with his father and, and state who lived in Athens while he was in, in Boston. But it, he wrote this article recently, Why Doctors Hate Their Computers. It was uh, published, um, I think, in the New Yorker magazine. It's about... Um, 20 pages long, so it's a, it's a relatively long article, but it talks about how much time physicians now spend on their computer versus how much they, time they spend interacting with the patient. Um, and all, the, and it's all this is, the bulk of the reason they spend so much time on their computer is they now have to answer a myriad of questions that are pushed out by um, Medicare or by the payers so they sit there and they have to click all these boxes to make sure they meet all these requirements just so they can get paid now. Um, and physicians have become to resent these computers because that there's, they're sitting there having a patient interaction and they're staring at this computer instead of staring at the patient in the face. Um, so that's become a, a huge issue uh, within medicine. Um, some people have com combated that by the use of what they call scribes. Um, those, of course, don't come cheap. And if you're a physician and you're, you're getting, you're only, your payment hasn't increased any, if anything it's gone down, now you have to have another employee there just to handle your computer for you. Um, so you have another person answering all these questions, trying to make them more efficient, but it doesn't always really boost a lot of that productivity. So it's a, it's a great article to read from a healthcare standpoint uh, and would recommend it as well as the book. So it's your rules. 
insurance rules right now. Now, I mean, I, I'm surprised. I kind of figured you were going to ask me, you ask your students this, about, you know, single-payer system. Is that coming or what? That's, that's interesting. I think it all depends on what happens politically with, uh, with the presidency in 2020. Uh, and if, um, if Republicans maintain any control of either House um, or the presidency, I don't think it's soon. I think at some point in my lifetime, uh, I'm 46 um, years old, and so I think at some point in my lifetime, I will, we will come close, if not achieve a single payer system in the United States. I'm a baby boomer and I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, well, I have to go to class a little bit, but I wanted to ask, has your accounting background have, like, has it helped you in your position? Oh, yes. Totally. As when I was talking about psychology, I probably focused a little too much on psychology. But the, I, I can't. If you have a, an accounting background or a, um, a, a psychology background, I think those are the two best for a, a position like mine. But the accounting world, and I will say this, and I know I'm a little biased by this. I think the accounting degree or certification is the most important business degree you can get. Um, because with an accounting degree, you can, the finance pieces, you, you'll know those, the economics pieces, you'll get, be able to get that pretty quickly. But if you can understand how to read a financial statement, understand debits and credits, I think by far that is the most important thing uh, that you can do. Um, one of the, my points I totally forgot to mention, kind of goes along with this, is understand da data. I mean, data is the king of the world right now. There's a book called Big Data talk about reading again, there's a book called Big Data, and just how um, everybody is mining data in everything you do. You know, we have a wealth of information in our, our electronic medical record, so we can extract all kinds of stuff about all kinds of people. We can actually take that, and we're starting to do a little bit of what we call predictive modeling with that. So we say, you know, we'll say Joe has been a patient of ours for the last five years. We've seen a steady rise in his A1C over those five years. So the A1C is a basic blood panel that you know that it kind of predicts um, blood sugar ultimately. Um, and so you see that A1C rising. So we now know that within the next year to two years, he's gonna be a diabetic. So what can we do today to take care of him, to prevent him from becoming a diabetic? Um, so the data piece, understanding how to do that, that's one of the skill sets I, I don't have is, is how to, I'm not good at writing uh, queries, getting data out of the system. I'm great at looking at it. I can manipulate it once I get it. Um, you know, Excel is your friend, learn Excel. Uh, and Excel can do so much. I mean, there's so much Excel can do that I have never even touched. Um, but if you're, if you're a really big uh, accounting nerd, um, then get into, start reading the Journal of Accountancy. And at the back part of the Journal of Accountancy, there's always a two to four page article on Excel and unique things Excel can do. And I've learned a ton of things you can do with it. I've not always used them or applied them, but there's a lot of things in there that you can do. So going back to your original question, yes, I think accounting is, is the best degree to have um, to be in my position. I think if, um, and, and if the dean was here, he'd probably hit me if I said this. I don't think, you know, if I had a marketing background, I don't think it would be the same as being um, a, as an accounting degree uh, in there. I think healthcare management's a good degree, um, but, um, you know, I still think accounting is a little stronger degree than the healthcare management uh, background. Other questions or comments? Are we good on? Huh? All right. All right, well, thank you all very much. Thank you for your attention, and uh, have a great rest of your day.